first of all, thank you for joining the session. Uh, the session is exploring distributed caching for faster GPU training with NVMe, GDS, and RDMA. My name is Hope Wang. I'm a developer advocate at Luxil, and I'm co-presenting with Bin Fan, who is a VP of technology at Luxil. Um, thank you for staying till the end. I know this is the last session of today, and it's a long day for everyone. And this is really like home stretch, guys. So uh, enjoy. And then. Um, today, I'm going to talk about why IO matters for um, model training, and then the challenges and opportunities, and also some options for optimizing IO. And also, Bin is going to talk about, from engineering perspective, how we design the architecture for uh, distributed caching, followed by exploration of NVMe, GDS, RDMA op optimizations. OK, I'm going to show you some data. And this is from uh, research by OpenAI in 2022. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. This is called the scaling law like in comparison with the Moore's law. So scaling laws basically means you can see from the left-hand side, the y-axis is called the, uh, the test loss, which means the lower it is, the better performance a model is. And there are three factors that are affecting this uh, accuracy or the performance of an LLM, which is compute, data size, and parameters. So you can see like, as the compute power grows and the performance of the model grows exponentially, so for the data set size, uh, measured by tokens and followed by the number of parameters. Basically, these three factors are affecting the efficiency or the accuracy or the performance of the LLM. And we're talking about the context of model training. So, um, why should we call, uh, why should we all care about IO, right? So, first of all, talking about compute power. And we all know that GPUs are expensive, GPUs are hard to get, and NVIDIA has just become, again, the most expensive company in the world with regard to their market cap, which means like you don't really want to waste your GPU waiting for data, but as the time you spend on I.O., like, like it's actually happening in each epoch depending on the behavior of your data loader during training, so your CPUs are idle waiting for data and also so for the GPU side. So this is really like an IO problem. How can we have efficient IO to maintain a high GPU utilization? And then this is the compute problem that I just talked about from the uh, scaling law by OpenAI. And the second one is that you can see the tokens grow exponentially. And this diagram here is really showing that all of these um, different models and how many tokens that they have uh, to build this model from ranging from Llama 3, from GPT, and you might have heard of a lot, a lot of other like LLMs. And the diagram means that by the year of 2028, we are running out of human-generated data, which means like we are using all the, the human-generated data from our human history to uh, train this, these models, and we are running out of these data. So you can see how much data we need to train these LLMs. So the scale is really from billions to trillions of tokens. So as these models scale up, so there is a higher demand to do a faster and more efficient IO handling to these massive amount of data sets. And then next, let's take a look at the model size, which is measured by the number of parameters. So on the left-hand side is the LLM model size growth throughout these years. You can see all of these models you are familiar with, and they are growing exponentially, like ranging from uh, 7 billion to uh, 1 trillion. So this is a really large number. And with these large number of parameters, you can see um, if you are familiar with model training for LLM, the checkpointing is really important. On the right-hand side, this is from uh, Meta Facebook. Like Every time when the job fails, they have to restart it again and again, and this is really a pain point. So faster checkpoint is really important because if you have the checkpoint, you will be able to restart a job and then without doing it from the beginning. 
And then um, also there are some new opportunities out there despite these challenges. Some of the emerging hardware advancements such as NVMe, uh, RDMA, which is a remote direct memory access, and also GPU direct storage. So these advancements are really giving us opportunities. I'm not going to uh, explain these concepts in details. If you are uh, interested, and you can just search these terms and what it means. So this here is a really a typical diagram to show what is the like back end system looks like for model training. So there is a back end network which manage the training data flow and the front end network will oversee the storage for data sets and checkpoints. So this uh, orange box I'm pointing here is going to is what we are going to discuss, is how we can make the I.O. for the training data storage and the checkpoint storage faster. So I will, I'm going to explore some possible architectures, and then uh, Bian is going to talk about how to design this efficient, scalable, distributed caching in this architecture. So there are really like three options to make the I.O. efficient and fast. And the first option is really simple, it's just to um, connect your uh, data lake, which is uh, your source of truth, which like store all of your data sets here to do the training jobs, connect that directly with your training nodes. So it's actually uh, access to a data lake directly, but it has a lot of um, concerns or uh, cons here because uh, talking about data lake, you're usually using like Amazon S3 kind of object storage. And there are some like slow, inconsistent performance problems shown by the code of 503 kind of code. And also like when you do this intensively, you can really occur a large amount of operations or uh, API costs. And the second option here is that you can add a high performance storage. So this is really typical in the HPC architecture, like HPC storage kind of storage. And then it can actually give you a high and consistent IO performance here. However, um, this is really costly because they, these are like expensive hardware or type of storage. And also you are have to maintain um, data consistency between HPC storage and data lake, your source of truth. There are some data migration happening in between. So um, it's actually adding you extra overhead of maintaining this um, my data migration. And the last option here is what we are going to discuss today. It's an option to add a distributing caching layer. So in the box of distributing caching, it's actually help you to get faster access because it only caches the hot data. Hot data means the data that is frequently accessed, or you call this work set. And also, like the distributed cache will help you to retrieve data from your data lake on demand. And also, if you have a cross-region or cross-cloud training nodes, maybe you have like leveraging different GPUs, so it can also uh, extend to multi-region, multi-cloud architecture very easily, as I've shown here of US uh, West 1 region. So um, this is really what we're going to discuss today. So next, uh, Bianu is going to talk about how we can design this high performance scalable distributed caching for faster GPU uh, training uh, using Luxo as an example. Uh, thank you, Hope. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Bin. So uh, Hope has already captured a lot of uh, key concepts, concepts. Hopefully, you are convinced why. Uh, providing a good I.O. for training, for model training is important. And also why in the current world, everyone is looking for data lakes, everyone is looking for having these uh, GPU farms and uh, having a layer in between this to provide high op IOPS per second and high throughput to feed the GPUs to keep them busy is a good idea. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about if I want to do something like this, what should I do? Okay. Using Aluxos as an example. Uh, essentially, what we're doing here, you can think Aluxos as a virtual layer, a virtual data lake layer on top of this storage uh, S3 Azure SAF GCS 
or this kind of storage, persistent storage. But providing high ARPs per second or providing high throughput to applications like Spark, Trino, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Ray, or Hive. Okay, so this is where this layer sits in this ecosystem. And this is a, a bunch of different companies that are using Alexio today. Uh, just hopefully to convince you this is something uh, practice a lot of different people or different organizations has already been using across different sectors. Okay, so what's interesting about the journey, like why I pick Alexio, not only because I'm from this company or I'm a, a deep contributor for this open source project, but also because it's a journey. So originally this was a research project in UC Berkeley uh, around 2012, 2013, as a, you can think as a sister project uh, for Apache Spark. They are, they are basically incubated from the same lab in UC Berkeley. And uh, in the very beginning, it was designed to be a memory speed data sharing uh, framework to handle or to manage the off-heap uh, RDDs for Spark, for, to, for Spark to share different RDDs across, uh, across, pro, pro, across different jobs. Okay, so this is from uh, the early, early days of the slides for Taikyan. Uh, so Alexi was called Taikyan a long time ago, okay. But along the way, okay, so it was born for big data workloads. Along the way, when I'm saying this, it's really about uh, four or five years ago when I was uh, working on the open source side with a lot of community users. I realized an interesting fact. I observed that uh, people try to use this technology for AI workloads, but there is a mismatch and people find the gaps. So where is the gap? So first of all, uh, the programming interface is very different. In the big data world, everything is standardized to HDFS interface or Hadoop, a distributed Hadoop interface. But for the uh, machine learning world, uh, most of these frameworks or the modelers, they are so used to download a data set to the laptop, work small set part of the uh, data set into the laptop, play with it. So our program is so used to use the POSIX or something similar to the POSIX. So essentially, we found a subset of the POSIX interfaces is, uh, is very important to enable the machine learning AI workloads. The second one is, uh, unlike the big data world, it started from the unstructured data, but now uh, more or less standardized to uh, structured data like parquet files, ORC files for data leaks. But for the model training, especially for LLM training, it's a, it's a mix of both structured data, but also unstructured data, especially for uh, CV models or for uh, multi, multi model training with audio, picture, video, text files. And also metadata scalability is not on the same level. For uh, model tr for training, especially for CV or multimodal training, we easily to see uh, people are talking about their training on top of uh, hundreds of millions or sometimes even billions of files or objects with h even higher concurrency to, uh, to read these data sets. But also uh, for these days, for the bigger model, it's easy to train this model for days or weeks or sometimes months of training. So the system to provide IO needs to be very reliable, okay? So you should provide really, really good reliability to the applications depending on the data. And in the, in the end, like enable fast writes, especially for sequential writes, very fast is very, very important because the checkpoints will just make uh, check, checkpoints will reduce the GPU utilization, basically. Okay, so we realize it's time to revisit a lot of uh, important choices uh, in this system architecture. Okay, so um, I, so I, I skip some some like early slides of the what Alexio has done in the, in the early days, but essentially what we end up is to fulfill the requirement we're talking about there. Um, we we should use a fully decentralized way. We should use a fully sharded approach for data and the metadata. That will just give us the flexibility and possibility to scale to billions or tens of billions of data. Uh, like in the middle of the design, like people are talking about even using some distributed uh, key value store or distributed database to do this metadata management. But still, uh, that's gonna be the bottleneck or that's gonna be very compl complicated in maintenance to handle that scale of the data, okay? So that's number one. The basic choice is to use the consistent hashing to handle data and the metadata. 
Okay, so uh, after you build such a layer, a bonus feature here is really you have this ability to map a storage address to a logical address, as I shown here. Uh, these days, we have seen customers they are have they're 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 maintaining multiple different clusters. They're maintaining different type of storages, uh, from the vendors to the public clouds and in different regions, and they want to provide a logical, a logical view to these customers. So what the benefits of having this another layer in between is the possibility to uh, make them into one logical namespace so that um, you can just have a, like I will talk about later, like a, from the programming perspective, it's much easier to, to handle. Okay, so under the hood, as I mentioned, like we use consistent hashing, so we're able to achieve much better performance because there we reduce the I/O RPC runs, and there's no more single point of failure, get a much much better reliability, and no more performance bottleneck on the master, uh, get a better performance, remove the master for critical paths, so no more journal, and that creates a lot of better uh, reliability. And many more other resource uh, performance optimizations. Um, so if you're interested, we have a technical blog on this. So some numbers we are able to achieve. Actually, this is a decoupled with the later slides. Uh, with tens of gigabytes uh, per worker, with the single worker, you can get uh, tens of gigabytes. And because this is a, a we, this is a cache, you are able to uh, preload data into this cache space. So we are able to fully utilize the storage, now the network of the storage between uh, storage and the Alexio space. Low latency, uh, so sub milliseconds or single digits uh, for faster response. And the scaling the linearly in capacity, this is very important by doing the consistent hashing or fully shard the data and the metadata, we're able to scale to tens of billions of the objects and files. And by fully remove a centralized components in this design, we're able to uh, make sure this system is highly available, but also uh, there's yeah no single point of failure to affect uh, availability. So that is basically the, on the very high level uh, what we are doing to refactor or re architect the system to fulfill the uh, machine learning AI type of workloads, okay? So, yeah, as I mentioned, like with this uh, uh, a logical layer between this uh, access layer as a logical namespace between the application and the storage, like uh, for example, you can run a Python program to uh, use different files or different storage systems as they are in this logical disk just like different directories. And this makes these modelers, uh, their life much, much easier because you have a single point of control how they're accessing this data, okay? Okay, so now let's see. We have this architecture improvement. Now let's see if we use as a NVMe SSDs what we achieve. Uh, I want to provide some FIO benchmark uh, with the, this is a configuration that we're using AWS EC2 uh, to benchmark and on the worker nodes. It's the worker nodes is basically the, uh, every single service hosting data on this consistent hashing ring. Okay, so we're using the i3 EM metal instance, and uh, we we choose this mod with type with because it's the it provides a high, uh, pretty good NVMEs uh, local NVMEs attached on this instance. Uh, and this is a client on the client side to translate Alexio protocol into a uh, POSIX-like interface on the, on, on the application side. So uh, what we're seeing is which a single worker were able to achieve, uh, with this setting, we're able to achieve uh, around eight uh, gigabytes per second for sequential reads. And on the Y axis, it's the performance we get, the throughput we get. On the X axis, it's how many threads are accessing this worker on the workload generator side. So as you can see, uh, we can not only quickly get, like when you have eight threads, we're able to get 7.6 uh, gigabytes per second, but also when you keep adding more concurrency to stress this system, the performance keeps pretty stable. And similarly, for FIO, we can use the random reads to stress the system. Uh, we get a similar result, so seven gigabytes throughput for the random reads. Uh, it's considered pretty good. And, 
but that's only a single worker. If you have multiple different workers, the design, the promise of using consistent hashing is to make sure every worker gets a similar around, similar amount of data and serve similar amount of workloads. Okay. So we're able to scale this basically the workloads and when we're adding more workers. So th that's a typo. That's your one worker, two worker, and four workers for three different bars. Okay. So essentially, uh, with more threads stressing the system, we can see the uh, basically with four workers, we can almost uh, double the performance we get from the two, two workers. So, okay, so basically, this approach works. It works pretty well to deliver the IOPS per second you can get from these NVMe servers and serve them to the, uh, to the applications. So I only show the FIO benchmark, but we also have the uh, uh, MLPerf results on storage uh, using GPU to stress test the system uh, to get pretty consistent results. Okay, okay. what's next? Uh, network transportation. I, uh, so first of all, there is a application side, and this is the uh, worker or service side. Uh, in the previous generation of the Luxio, we were using gRPC to transfer the data from the workers to this application side, okay? Um, gRPC is nice. Uh, actually, I proposed to our community to, to use the gRPC to do the data transfer. Um, but along the way, we realized, okay, we switched back to Netty. Um, well, Netty is internally a library. It's an event-based ev library to do very low-level uh, data transmission. A lot of applications are built on top of Netty. Uh, so the nice thing of using Netty so, uh, is they can support zero copy much better and use much less resource. And the gRPC is another layer on top of Netty and the Java land, but it controls everything. It's very hard for you to do the polling management and resource management because your gRPC takes care of everything. So uh, we basically, for this one, we basically continue to use gRPC for the control panel, control plane, and we switch to Netty to in implement data plan. Like once there is a lot of control message, it's still using gRPC. It gives a lot of flexibility when you're adding new fields, when you're adding new RPCs. But for the very basic items, when you are transferring data, reading data, writing data from one point to another, uh, we implement that using Netty. And also doing a lot of uh, optimizations on the precision reads to make sure we're not amplifying the, the amount of data transferred. Okay, so with these results, we see uh, much better, like combining using Netty and combining with uh, using uh, a lot of a uh, uh, prefetch and a smart intelligence to uh, to identify how much data you need. We're able to see much better performance. But again, this is still based on Ethernet. Okay. So uh, one work we're currently doing is to, uh, as, as I mentioned, like we are using Netty to build this data trans transfer or data transition layer, data panel, a data plane. Okay, so the easy thing we are switching this to is to uh, using RDMA. Okay, you, if you have an infinite band, if you have a rookie network, so we want to fully utilize the bandwidth and latency. So in this case, uh, what we're doing is to replace the Netty uh, data translation layer to this uh, using the uh, UCX. U UCX is another open source uh, framework. It basically abstracts away the underlying transportation, and they have a different language binding. And we have we found like a, it's pretty well adopted in the community. So that's something we're trying out to uh, basically using. UCX to uh, further improve the data transmission uh, between one point to another uh, to leverage RDMA network. Okay. Okay. So another experiment we're doing here is to really uh, explore how we can do the checkpointing faster. The current way we're doing, there's already a lot of optimizations we're doing. For example, if you're checkpointing anything, uh, it's mostly some. GPU, uh, like a rank zero GPU, is uh, writing the model files sequentially to some place. And hopefully this file can be persisted to some place later. Um, so that is the workloads, how it looks like for the uh, checkpointing workloads in the ML. So what we're doing today is to enable this fast checkpointing. So we first let these uh, GPU ap applications write into this logical disk Alexio is presenting. and 
uh, to the local disk, and then we just upload this data asynchronously to the cloud or to the persistent storage. So that's how we're doing to match uh, the RD, uh, to, uh, to match the almost the local storage speed for checkpointing, async checkpointing. But what we can do better? Okay, so there is something called the GDS or GPU direct storage. Okay, so one thing you can do. Uh, this is some also some uh, experimental is. We can use the GPU direct storage to write the data to using RDMA, using the RDMA I just mentioned, uh, put this data to a remote Alexio workers uh, user memory, oh, sorry, CPU memory, and then we can just persist this data from this CPU memory to the NVMe. So in this case, we can just have an even better uh, performance to enable fast checkpointing. Okay. So, so much for the technical discussion, but I want to show also in the real world how people are using, can use a layer like this to uh, benefit their really the machine learning beta platform. So I'm using one customer, I call this customer Z, this is a pu public company, and they are, uh, they have the pain points of the complexity of the building the training, uh, training platform and inferencing across different clouds because they are really embracing the hybrid cloud use case. To, to for the training uh, for their for their machine learning platform. This is how it looks like. Okay, so in the middle column, this is their central data lake. There's primary data lake. It's HDFS there, but they also want to leverage the GPU resource from different regions, from different cloud providers. So in this case, logically, what happened is in different training, in different training cloud. They can be in different cloud providers. They're reading the data from this uh, primary data lake and also pushing checkpoints to this storage. After the model is trained and there is a mechanism to pull the data, push the data from the central data lake to this inferencing uh, infrastructure. So they, they have thousands of the inferencing machines to uh, do the online inferencing. Okay, so this is how it looks like on the, uh, in the nutshell. And the scale is running as hundreds of data scientists and machine learning engineers working on this platform, having thousands of training jobs per day. And the scale of their GPU farm is a thousands, uh, at least a few thousands GPUs. So this is what they're running. So the problem, the first problem they're hitting is really the, on the training, how to make the training efficient, okay? So the first approach they are, they're, they're, they're attempting here is to create a object store in the same training, in each training cloud, and building a syncing process, or you can think it's a menu copy, or SCP, to move data, to copy data from the central data lake to this object store for each training cloud. And then doing, doing this training data uh, checkpoints locally, relatively locally. Okay, so you can you can uh, logically you can think this object store is mapped to what uh, Hope says in the earlier talk, in the earlier part of the talk, it can be the HPC storage or other some other storage. The problem is okay. So first of all, using a conventional object store here has a le high latency and limited bandwidth, but also uh, it creates this more synchronization across different components uh, like. These days, people are using data clouds, or sorry, data lakes, because we want to remove data silos, okay? But now, by doing this, because I want to enable the training, I'm creating a new data silo, which is not good. Uh, again, data has to be in multiple different copies. This creates high overhead in maintenance and also in the storage. Okay, so uh, what they have achieved is to basically, uh, using Alexio here as a layer, as a caching layer to, um, you can think it's a proxy for this uh, data lake. It's a virtual data lake in each training cloud, okay? And in this case, the training infrastructure going to Alexio to access data, and the, if the data is hot, it will be residing in this uh, Alexio. So what they achieve, uh, interestingly, like let's forget about the technical benefits first. From the business side, they're able to unlock the GPU resource in any cloud is if you have the Kubernetes settled down. And with Aluxio, you can just uh, launch a Aluxio cluster in 10 minutes, and then you're able to access your primary data lake. Versus, in the traditional way, you need to purchase the, uh, the data storage resource in this training cloud and moving the data around that can take from days to weeks. 
So in this way, you can eliminate data migration and uh, improve the agility to embrace the data cloud, uh, uh, a data, sorry, a public cloud vendor who has, or cloud vendor who has this uh, GPU resource for greater um, bargaining negoti negotiation power, basically. And also in this case, they are able to uh, improve the GPU utilization. So essentially, previously, they have a 30% of GPU utilization because having this caching layer, which has been using this NVMe resource in a very, uh, to, 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 to serve this data queries in an efficient way, they're able to increase the GPU utilization from 30 to 90% for LLM training and for 20 to 40% for search recommendation ads training. So they are, with this new result, they are able to expand their GPU fleet uh, from 500 to more than 2,000. Okay. So, and in this case, also we have the end-to-end -end training speed boosted by 2.5x. Okay. Okay. So essentially, uh, after this, we are able to see good results having this training. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to pause here, and I know I'm running out of time, so in case you have any questions, feel free to uh, find me, and Hope will be here for a while. Yeah. Um, these are our emails. I'm happy to connect with all of you and see if you have any questions we can address. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, perhaps th there might be a, uh, uh, my understanding is it does not reach to your uh, understanding. So p perhaps this might be a stupid question, but I have a question about the, you know, uh, uh, consistent hashing. Uh, you know, uh, you said that there is no master in the uh, cluster, class of the uh, workers, but consistent hashing, uh, in my understanding, requires uh, you know, you, uh, the, at least the number of the workers of the uh, workers. Uh, it, uh, each worker needs to understand the cluster. So, how do you manage it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, with consistent hashing, how do we handle? How do we let everyone? both the workers and the application side understand who are in this consistent hashing and how they are dividing their work around, right? So this is called membership uh, of this, this ring, consistent hashing ring. Uh, in, because I mentioned like in, in, the new, in the latest world, everyone is using for machine learning, they, almost everyone is using Kubernetes, okay? So a very easy answer to that is to use like whatever people are choosing for Kubernetes, how to serve a small information in a consensus way, which is, uh, it is like we will just store uh, this in the ring information, which is very small, fairly small, uh, in this in on etcd. Yeah. Thank you. Very clear. Yeah. Uh, thanks for presentation and as for faster. Checkpointing um, when there are several um, distributed caches, um, how how do you preserve the consistency between distributed caches? Uh, the question is how do we keep consistency? Yeah, between or caches. Uh, between the cache. So I guess the question, or like, I, we need to clarify a little bit here, is uh, the consistency between within a Luxio layer or a in within the caching layer or the consistency uh, between this caching layer and also the storage layer. So which one you are referring um, to? Uh, caching layer. Um, in, the, um, in the slides, uh, there can be multiple distributed caches. Um, as long as they're not writing to the same file name, mm -hmm. like there should be no uh, collision or conflict, yeah. right? And in some cases, uh, the training job output the uh, model files on the cache, and on the other side, uh, um, the inference service want to uh, pull the models to serving uh, the inference services. So uh, in that case, uh, when the checkpoint uh, persistent uh, write out to the, um, the 
object storages, and yeah. can we uh, control the um, the policy? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what if like there is a, in like when still someone on the training side is producing these checkpoints, but on the inferencing side, uh, the consumer tried to pull the data there. And how do we control the? Uh, how do we coordinate between these two, right? So uh, I would say, like right now, um, the this is not is like it's it's not in the real time. I don't see this happening in the real time. Perhaps in the future, like right now, uh, I actually I, I just uh, I skipped a few few slides there for the customer. I'm referring to there. So they're already doing the the near real time learning online learning. Uh, so the previous the time from their persisting uh, checkpoints to the checkpoints to be distributed across these uh, inferencing machines, uh, the delay is about like 20 to 30 minutes. So that is not real time. But like right now, what they're doing is like with Aluxio, they're also using Aluxio to, to, to do that. Uh, they're able to reduce this down to three to five minutes. And that can reduce, uh, that can improve this model relevancy a lot. Uh, but uh, back to your question, so uh, the the way we're like, I guess the the way we're doing this is uh, right now you have a control to put data from the uh, you you have to you can control how soon the data is persisted into Aluxio by uh, sorry from Aluxio to the storage. If you want this to be a synchronous, there is a, some flag you can do this. Like, make sure I'm writing something through Aluxio. I'm synchronously writing this to object store. So once this happened, finish, owning this complete, you can see this uh, data from the object store, and then you can leverage Aluxio to distribute the data uh, wider. Uh, but we're also working on a uh, smarter, smarter way to do this by having. Like basically having some controls, you just write in to Aluxio first, and then we will asynchronously persist the data to storage. But in that case, you should not rely on the persistent storage to distribute that, but using Aluxio to, uh, you can use using Aluxio to distribute the data to your inferencing machine. So uh, because we can, we can we can control uh, when that completes and make sure that data is complete, and also in a way. Uh, I don't think we will write to the same files multiple times, so I, at least I don't see this conflict uh, within the Aluxio layer. So uh, typically when they're writing, they will write to different file names with different timestamp or something like that. Okay, got it, thank you. Cool. Okay, uh, I will be here, staying here for a little while. I know this is the last talk, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to grab me. Thank you so much. Thank you.